The topic for the day is uh, Secret of Success. And this is also based on what Swamiji takes in uh, management seminars. See, the basic material for this comes from Bhagavad Gita. See, what is interesting is, Bhagavad Gita is a spiritual book, yogic book you can say. The aim of Vedantic scriptures, including Bhagavad Gita, is to raise our level of consciousness and ultimately make us uh, reach the state of self-realization or God-realization. That is the purpose. That is the purpose of these highest texts on Vedanta. But what is interesting is, not just in the last decade or two, but even uh, about, we can say, a half a century or so, there has been an awareness about the principles of Bhagavad Gita both in East and West and the principles are applied in management consultancy, in corporate world in, and in various other spheres, in various other fields. There was an article in, uh, I think, New York Times or Washington Post that uh, slowly the textbook Bhagavad Gita is replacing the book Art of War, which is a traditional Chinese book which has been traditionally taught in management schools also. So Bhagavad Gita is replacing the book Art of War. This was an article that we read about a few years back. But what we must understand is Bhagavad Gita is not a book for management consultants. Bhagavad Gita is not a book for uh, for making us understand what success in the world and other practical aspects of Vedanta. But the knowledge contained in Bhagavad Gita can be used at practical level also. And that is what is one of, one of the greatest contributions of our Swamiji and maybe other speakers also. That they have, they have been able to gather the highest philosophy from Bhagavad Gita and also apply them at the day-to-day -day lives of practical modern people wherever they, it is applicable. It could be applicable to your student, it could be applicable to a person who is working in a corporate or an athlete or anybody for that matter. So the basic material of that is given in bits and pieces here. As I said, the overall picture that Bhagavad Gita paints is something else. It is talking about the highest uh, state of self-realization or that that the what, which is the essential Upanishadic message is also the message of Bhagavad Gita also. Right. Coming to the subject, when we whenever we talk about success, Suppose if you ask a person as to what really constitutes success or you ask this question to yourself, do you consider yourself to be successful? Some people say yes, some people say so-so or average. Some people do not consider themselves successful. We need to understand as to why we are thinking like that or what is the definition of success. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was a great sage of this land. He lived in the 19th century. Towards the end of his life, he produced a bunch of monks, sannyasins, who were all in their youth, very highly charged they were. And we all know about the greatest of them, which is Swami Vivekananda. So if anybody asks who is the disciple of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, everybody, not only here, everywhere in the world or everywhere in India, they will immediately relate to Swami Vivekananda. Suppose if I ask you the question, do you know of any other 
డిసైపుల్ ఆఫ్ స్వామి డిసైపుల్ ఆఫ్ రామకృష్ణ పరమహంస ఎక్సెప్ట్ ఫార్ దోస్ ఐ వుడ్ సే బెంగాలీస్ హూ ఆర్ క్లోజ్లీ అసోసియేటెడ్ విత్ రామకృష్ణ మట్ ఆర్ మిషన్ మోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ అస్ మే నాట్ బి ఏబుల్ టు రికాల్ ఎనీ నేమ్స్ ఆర్ నో ఎనీ అదర్ పర్సన్స్ అదర్ దాన్ స్వామి వివేకానంద but they were also stalwarts some of them also served outside india and maybe they were also gyanis from inside but the question is why do not we know them and why do we know swami vivekananda more in the context of our topic today we can say swami vivekananda is a uh, successful swami and uh, we do not take other names in the same measure so the question arises okay just for the sake of uh, those who do not know there are stalwarts like ramakrishna ananda ummananda uh, swami turiyananda swami sharadananda they were all stalwarts and they were all contemporaries of swami vivekananda but probably uh, their names are not as popular or as famous as swami vivekananda now why do we know swami vivekananda much more because he took this knowledge to the west he gave uh, inspiring lectures all over the world all over india he was able to visualize and bring up ramakrishna mission at ramakrishna mat and popularized seva whatever it is so all these we can say are achievements of great swami vivekananda many other things also i am just naming a few so if i say there were other disciples of ramakrishna paramahamsa who were equal or even sometimes more or even little less doesn't matter they are all at great heights to swami vivekananda you will with much reverence listen to the names of other people but then what question will come to everybody's mind is all of them are great you say fine but what did they do that is the question what did they do so if i so that means if i say do you measure yourself as a successful person it invariably boils down to what has a person achieved so how do we understand success success is always measured in terms of what you achieve in the world so a person did so many things that is what is the uh, way in which you can measure the success or failure of a person if i say i have a neighbor uh, who is very good he gets up early in the morning 4:30 he does his study he does his yoga he goes for the morning walk and he is prompt at its uh, breakfast table at a particular time he goes to office and does his work diligently he takes care of his family spends time with his wife and child and uh, his uh, having this daily routine like this and very meticulous very nice person i know he is my neighbor and if i say i consider him as a successful person suppose if i say i consider him as a successful person you will say agree with you that he has been a good person and he has maybe uh, discharged his duties at home and office fine but to call him a successful person you will say what did he achieve what did he do who is he is he a businessman is he a professor Uh, has he uh, inspired students has he written books whatever it is how do we measure the success is only based on one's achievement so if i ask to name a few successful people invariably everybody will talk about let us say amitabh bachchan or uh, rajnikanth as a successful person in movies uh, sachin tendulkar or saurav ganguly or ms dhoni as cricketers narendra modi or uh, amit shah or somebody else as politicians 
you will be able to relate to these people as successful people because they have made a mark in their field and that mark is measurable tangibly in terms of their achievement so measurement of success is always with reference to achievement of something in the world the second aspect is how do we measure the degree of success degree of success is always measured only by comparison so who is more successful captain of india whether it is saurav ganguly or ms dhoni the if you say ms dhoni is more successful in compared to ganguly or in compared to somebody else azharuddin that he is more successful and again you can compare by saying how many test matches he won in india and how many test matches azhar won in india how many test matches he won abroad and how many matches dhoni won abroad like that you can compare and you say with reference to this person that person is more successful compared to that person he is not that much successful we may not use the term failure but less than more successful let us say so therefore in that sense success and failure are also relative to each other they differ only in degree and a person can be termed more or less successful with reference to comparison with others therefore whenever we talk about success in the world it is not referring to one person alone yes we may uh, talk about his achievements but invariably what comes to the discussion is that vis a vis others how does he stand how does he count vis a vis others so measurement of success is always with reference to his achievement and degree of success is always with reference to comparing his achievement with others there are two aspects to success suppose you ask a person to define success or what he considers as success one person may say that if i am able to achieve a million rupees in my bank account if i meaning i if i become a millionaire that way i consider that to be success if i build a house of my own and stay in my own house that is success for me if i am able to sell 100 books of uh, swamiji in one year with on the readers let us say that i consider as success so like this it will vary from person to person for some if you say i become the managing director of this company that is success or i start my own company that is success for somebody else if i am able to get myself promoted from this position of a, a clerk to a higher position of a manager that is success even before retirement i become a general manager that is a great success like that somebody may define success It's exactly like that somebody wants to get into a indian cricket team that he may define as success for somebody it could be a ranji cricket team for somebody it could be a club cricket team that he may define as success so what is the measurement or how he consider himself to want to achieve something for success will definitely vary from person to person uh it need not be sometimes uh, tangible it may be intangible also that i want to be known but invariably that achievement will have some measurement okay when i say i want to be known if my followers uh of the youtube channel crosses 500 1000 i consider that success somebody may have a million followers i am not bothered about that or i do not know that if at my present level i come to 500 that's a great success for me is what i consider a success so following may be intangible money may be more tangible yet it can be measured in terms of some solid number so therefore what everybody consider as success is something that they want to achieve in the external world so the first aspect of success is an external achievement as i said this varies from person to person for some it could be a corporate uh, counselor for some it could be a mla in the state for some it could be mp in the parliament or a prime minister also at various levels but it is an achievement that is what they relate to as success 
what Vedanta says is, no doubt, this is one aspect of success, but this aspect of success is variable, is a variable factor in the sense, it varies for you also from time to time, it may vary from one place to another, importantly, it may vary from person to person. For one person, what is defined as success need not be a success definition for the other person. And for you also, at different stages, it may vary. So, external achievement is a variable factor. But what everybody is unconsciously wanting out of success, sometimes they may know it, sometimes they may not know it, but there is another aspect which is internal, which you may call happiness, satisfaction, joy, that is related to this external achievement. So everybody says that I want to become a millionaire, but what is understood is becoming a millionaire is what is going to satisfy me. I want to uh, travel to so many countries that I consider as a great achievement or a success. And if I do that, my mind will be satiated. I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. If I'm able to uh, become the prime minister, I'll be happy. So therefore, this internal satisfaction or joy or happiness, which we use as synonym in this context, the common denominator for all achievements, is equally applicable for all. External achievement will definitely is variable factor and it will vary from person to person. What is Vedantic point of view here is, People all over the world relate internal satisfaction to external achievement. In other words, they say, if I achieve that, I'll be happy. If I get into that Indian team, I'll be happy. If I become a prime minister, I'll be happy. If I earn a million rupees, I'll be happy. So, internal achievement is following, internal satisfaction is following external achievement is what most people keep their targets to be. Vedanta says these two must be delinked. You need not link your internal satisfaction with external achievement. If you are able to give, if you are able to understand and apply a formula by which you are able to derive that internal joy by whatever formula it gives, if you are able to derive that internal joy, then External achievement becomes easier. This is what is the position of Vedanta. I repeat again. Internal joy or internal satisfaction is no doubt very important. Do not link it to external achievement. If you are able to get that internal joy, happiness or satisfaction by yourself, by some formula, by whatever it is. After that, Vedanta does not say that Stop with that and do not go for external achievement. It says you have to go all out and achieve whatever you want to achieve in the world. But having delinked and focused on the internal satisfaction, your external achievement becomes easy. Not just it becomes easy, irrespective of whatever your mental state is, your external achievement you will be able to relish and enjoy only when you are satisfied internally. There is a famous uh, saint, poet, Swami Jagaraja, the great saint Jagaraja, who lived in 19th century or 18th century uh, in, uh, in Tamil Nadu. He was a great devotee of Lord Rama and he composed various songs. In one of the songs, he says, Shantamu Leda Saukyamu Ledu. Shantam means peace. Leda means if you don't have, if it, it's not there. Saukyam means material prosperity, which can be equated to success. Ledu, you don't have. That means, he says, if you don't have inner peace, if you don't have internal satisfaction, you your success is not known. Either you don't have Saukyam, or even if you have that, you are poorer by it. I mean, you are not going to relish it or enjoy it for all practical purposes. You do not consider it to be enough for your success. 
So therefore, whenever we talk about successful people, what we perceive of successful people is no doubt correct, but it is up to a limited point. That Tendulkar is successful, Amitabh Bachchan is successful, or Narendra Modi is successful, is not uh, wrong. But what is to be analyzed is, how do they consider themselves to be successful from their standpoint? We may consider all of them, Ambani or Tata, Birla, whoever it is, in various fields, they could be successful. But what is real success is how you consider yourself to be successful. And for yourself to be successful, both these things has to be achieved. External achievement is also important. More important is the internal satisfaction. And Vedanta says, don't put the cart before the horse. Do not link your internal satisfaction with external achievement. Independently, you be focused on achieving internal satisfaction. And then you will find that external achievement becomes easy. Otherwise, even if you have achieved great things in the world, uh, like money or power or status or whatever it is, if you do not feel happy, satisfied about it, you are not really successful from your standpoint. Forget about how the world may look at you or how others may look at you. It is up, up to their perception. It, it may be a very limited perception. But success has to be defined from your angle. And your angle has to include these two. That is external achievement and internal satisfaction. Right. Now the question arises that if we consider, one is we talked about the definition of success and the measurement of success, degree of success, and then the two aspects of success. Now if we have to define success with reference to time factor, if there is one word for success, so what is success here? We talked about external achievement. Every external achievement, what we relate to is, if I become this, if I become that, or if I achieve this, or if I achieve that. Our achievement invariably is therefore not now, in the present. If I say I want to sell 100 books, that means I have not sold now, I want to achieve it in future. I want to become Prime Minister means it is again in future. I want to get into the Ranji cricket team means it is again in future. Therefore, when we talk about success, we are talking about a future achievement. Anything with reference to future, understand it to be an effect. Anything with reference to future is an effect. So therefore, one word for success is that it is an effect. Success is an effect. When we say success is an effect, According to the law of causation, every effect must have a cause. This is the law. We are slightly deviating, but we will understand this cause and effect. These four statements are de derived from uh, Vedanta at the very highest level, but it is very useful to go through this even at our practical level. The whole universe functions on the basis of cause and effect. Maybe in some future class we will take about this in detail, the law of karma, destiny and various those, those things. But the whole universe functions on the basis of cause and effect. The first principle is that these are very simple to understand, not very, uh, you know, great uh, uh, high philosophies embedded in it. At the practical level it can be easily understood. As the cause, so the effect. Whatever is the nature of the cause, that will be the nature of the effect also. If the cause is good, the effect is good. If the cause is faulty, the effect is faulty. If you sow a mango seed, you will get a mango tree. As the cause, so the effect. If you have a gold bar, you can convert it into a gold chain. It, it will not become an iron chain. If you have an iron bar, you can convert it into an iron chain. So, if the cause is iron, the effect is also iron, iron chain. If the cause is gold, then the effect is uh, gold chain. As the cause, so the effect. If the seed is healthy, the tree is healthy. If the seed is not healthy, the uh, tree is also not coming out healthy. As the cause, so the effect. 
second is effect is nothing but cause in another form so what is cause today becomes the effect tomorrow cause transforms itself into effect what is wood today becomes the table tomorrow only the time of manifestation there is a gap so what is seed today becomes a tree few years later you can relate to every aspect of the effect to the cause actually so effect is nothing but cause in another form if you remove the cause from the effect nothing of the effect remains obvious if you remove the gold from the chain nothing of the chain remains if you remove the wood from the table nothing of the table remains if you are able to remove any cause from the effect that it has produced nothing of the effect remains therefore the fourth statement is important cause is concurrent and inherent in the effect inherent means it is there within concurrent means it runs parallelly as we said only the time gap is there for the effect to manifest and you may see it in a different name and form but the moment the cause is there effect is already there moment the seed is there the tree is already there with a net and this is how and in fact seed and tree example is what is taken up in chandogya uh, operation a brilliant brilliant example when shweta ke is given the knowledge of tattva masi this is what is the example so when the seed is there tree is already there just that we are not able to see the tree yes we will not be able to see the tree at that point but every aspect of the tree is hidden in it that is going to grow into a tree later on so cause is there means effect is already there effect is there means cause is embedded in it so cause and effect are inseparable this is the law and there is nothing apart from cause and effect that functions in this universe in this world this must be first you gulp it if you are not able to relate to it you think about it because when i say gulp it nothing in this class or anywhere in vedanta that you must take it for granted you have to apply your thought on it think about it but i am making a statement which you note it for the time being that there is no factor in this universe which is not functioning apart from this cause and effect it is the mother of all laws in this context many people would uh, believe in what is known as luck bad luck good luck accident fate i am using uh, related terms and uh, they are all proper terms also and it is interesting if you go to the meaning of luck or the term that is used for luck in indian language it reveals something we may not be able to have an interaction here but think about all the names that you know for luck in indian languages most people when we have asked this question they come up with uh, in bengali they use the term bhagya they say but bhagya is more bhagya means bhagya bhagya is morely more used in terms of uh, fate to do to say that it is all it's all written here it's my fate in that sense it is there but it can be used uh, sometimes as what you get something in your life also for that uh, purpose it can be used they use the word kismat i think which is a urdu word uh, which probably translates as luck another important word is which we use in tamil also which is not a tamil word it's a sanskrit word is adrishtam adrishtam is also luck so when a person what is this word uh, adrishtam means drishtam in sanskrit means seen what is seen is drishtam a in sanskrit usually gives the meaning of opposite non so in english when you say violence and non violence vegetarian and non vegetarian like that a in sanskrit is equal to non in english in most of the cases vidya avidya karma akarma 
like that uh, uh, becomes the it gives the opposite meaning when it is when a word is prefixed by a. So exactly like that, drishtam and adrishtam. Drishtam is seen, adrishtam is not seen, unseen. So the question arises: What is unseen? For example, you take a person works for thirty days in a company, and at the end of it, he gets salary of twenty thousand rupees. He takes that money and gives it to his wife or mother. The wife doesn't say, hey, "You are very lucky today. You got twenty thousand rupees." It is not luck. He has worked for 30 days in the office and uh, he has been given salary for it. What is the big deal about it? But one day, if you get a lottery of a lakh of rupees and that you give it to your wife, she will say, what, what a good luck to me that you got one lakh rupees. It's good luck. It is luck. Or suddenly one lakh goes away from your purse. Bad luck. Fate. All these terms that we use there. So, the term Adrishtam is used in the second scenario. In the first case, the cause is that he has worked for 30 days and the effect is that he has got a salary for it. The effect of 20,000 rupees salary is seen and the cause that he has worked for it is also seen visible, understandable. In the second case, the effect of 1 lakh rupees is seen. But what is not seen is, what is the cause that he has put to deserve it? That is not known. Maybe you have given various charitable donations at various points of time, all adding up to this effect at this point of time. Similarly, at various points of time, you caused uh, uh, loss for other people and that loss is all accumulated and it is suddenly coming up to you like this, as one lakh rupees going away from you. This is how we have to relate to cause and effect. At this point, you may say, what is the proof? It may be just a conjecture. Possible. But for which I would say, we have to deeply study the law of karma to come to this conclusion. But for the time being, just focus on this word, adrishtam. So in the first case, cause is seen, adrishtam. In the second case, cause is not seen, it is taken as adrishtam. So, there is nothing that is working in this world beyond the cause and effect and every aspect of science that is unearthing various laws are just based on cause and effect. One point that you can think about it because this is not the topic for today is that if you see in this world or universe how it is all functioning, it is functioning in perfect order. That is why it is called as cosmos and not chaos. If something is perf functioning in perfect order, then the perfect order is relatable only by these two words, which is cause and effect. But for cause and effect, nothing in the world would have progressed in science and technology or any aspect of this world. So, cause and effect is that which is functioning. And coming back to our topic here, we said success is an effect. Success belongs to future. Success is an effect. Therefore, the next question arises as to, if success is an effect, what is the cause? What is the cause? The cause for success is action in the present. And this is where we were relating to in the last class, we mentioned a statement in Bhagavad Gita which says Siddhir Bhavati Karmaja. Siddhir Bhavati Karmaja. Success is born of action. Chapter 4, verse 12. We come to it. All over the world, People are clamoring for success. Nobody wants failure. Everybody clamors for success. As I said, whatever they consider as success. So there are a lot of books on success. There are a lot of seminars and workshops on success because it is a it is a topic that will attract everybody because the inherent nature of everybody is that they want to be successful. Nobody wants failure and which is not wrong. Everybody wants success. But what people should understand from this analysis is that when we clamor for success, we are pegging our thought and focus on future. Whereas if you are able to focus on the cause, which is action, then we will understand that 
effect has to be automatic. So therefore, if a person is taught about cause or taught about what is action, he need not worry about success. This is the standpoint of Vedanta. So in other words, we should stop worrying about success and start worrying about action. If a person is given the formula of the right action, he need not worry about success. Swami Ramatirtha makes a very great statement here. Your motto in life should be to strive, to struggle, not to succeed. Very fascinating statement. Your motto in life should be to strive, to struggle, not to succeed. Not to succeed does not mean that we quote failure, obviously no. But the focus is not on success. But that should be the focus on, he says, to be in the striving and in the struggling. If a person has understood, practiced and experienced the joy deriving out of doing action, which is what he means by to be in the striving and to be in the struggling. He will not really bother about success. Not only that, the joy that he derives in the work, in the action, is far, far superior to the joy that you get while you taste the success. This has to be very carefully understood. When a person a tennis player, let us say, he wins the Wimbledon Trophy or a French Open Trophy and uh, no doubt at that point of time, it is extremely enjoyable and he relishes that success. You see players kissing the trophy and uh, you can see the joy on their face. You cannot deny it. Similarly, any achievement that you achieve also, you turn back in your own life and see or you see in others' lives also, they are extremely happy when success comes. You, you cannot deny it. And at that point of time, that's, that happiness is real for them. But you have to go a little bit and see that when is it that when you are, the, let us say this player who has won the trophy for the two weeks of the tournament, not just that, even before that when he practices for the tournament, he puts in extreme hard work and every bit of that hard work is actually enjoyable for them. He may not be able to consciously register it because entire focus of the world is to relate success only to, uh, relate a joy only to the achievement of success only at the point of time of getting that success. But what is interesting is, if you go through the experience of him going through the striving and struggling before achieving that success, that is the time actually he is enjoying himself the most. When we talked about ego, this is a point we covered, it's worth covering now. Whenever you are immersed in an activity, when you are in the striving, when you are in the struggling, when you are actually getting into it completely, you forget yourself and you are involved in that action. I am using the word involved positively here. You are actually unconsciously in a very joyous mode. Carefully note here, you are producing or you are writing success for the future at that point of time. And at that point of time, as much as possible, if you see that, you are deviating yourself away from the ego. But when you achieve that success, and you receive the trophy, what is actually for the time being enjoying that success is your individuality, your ego, which puts a signature that I have achieved this. And as I say, at that point of time, it is enjoyable, but it cannot be equated to the joy that you put in what you get while striving and struggling. So this, he says, must be the motto of life. Swami Chinmayananda, our Paramaguru, makes a very fascinating statement. He says, you must keep your ideal or goal in life so high, so high, that you must not be able to reach it. Fascinating statement. 
you keep your ideal or goal so high that you must not be able to reach it. What does it mean? It, all that it means is that when you want to achieve uh, climbing Mount Everest as the ultimate, let us say that is the tallest peak and that is what you have kept it. You have to, let us say, cross various peaks in achieving that. Let us assume that. Each and every peak that you cross is also relative success. But you will not rest content till you, till you reach that uh, Mount Everest. So, what it means is that when you are always wanting to reach the highest point, you will be in continuous striving and struggling irrespective of whatever you achieve midway in your life. So, therefore, it is not uh, it is not Enough if we get some small things in life and get satisfaction about it. That is not what Vedanta wants you to achieve. Even in terms of external achievement of success, we are saying, if you consider yourself as a sparrow, you can maximum become a better sparrow. And the sparrow's level is to fly up to the first floor of a building. That's about the, or second floor, whatever it is. A pigeon may fly up to a certain level. Up to a tall tree or much more than that, it will fly. Uh, that is pigeon. So, if you consider yourself a, as a pigeon, you will fly at that level. You can be a better pigeon or a, a, a little less worse pigeon. That's all. But an eagle soars in the atmosphere. If I consider myself as a sparrow, my success is limited to the level of the sparrow only, however great I achieve. I will be the greatest sparrow, nothing else. And this is what every peep, every person will achieve at this level. So, world will not give you any more value than what you give for yourself. Here we are not talking about any egoistic notion, please. If you consider yourself to be a clerk, you can be maximum a better clerk. That's about all. And the world will view you as a clerk, nothing more than that. You cannot even conceive or aspire to become a managing director. Not possible. Similarly, if you say I am a small businessman, this this is my area of activity, and this is all I can I can relate to. I want to become a millionaire, and that's what it is. Yes, you can achieve that, and maybe a little more. That's about all. And you will be understood as a small millionaire or whatever your level is by others also. And it cannot be anything more than that. Because you yourself have set a value for yourself like that. Therefore, the first and foremost thing is that when all other creatures have their limitation, Vedanta says, your limitation is imaginary and self-imposed. It is not so. You can aspire to become a managing director or a chairman or a much more than that or or a group of companies you can open also for yourself anywhere and everywhere that you can achieve. Swami Ramadita talks about a small boy who was an orphan, who was playing in the orphanage and Lord uh, Mayor uh, had visited that orphanage for some reason and he asked that small boy, what is your name? He happened to see. So that boy said, Tun, 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 Whittington, Lord Mayor of London, he says. A small boy. He doesn't know what it is, maybe to be a mayor or whatever it is, but his thought is that I am, I am Lord uh, Whittington, Mayor of London. This is what that thought of that boy was going on at that point of time and the story is he became the mayor. So if you say or if you keep a goal that I want to get into a government job, I want to do that and nothing wrong with any of this, please, we are not demeaning any achievement, we are not demeaning any activity for that matter. We are talking about the thought process of a person as a human being. You need not, even if you are a sparrow, you need not confine yourself to be a level of a sparrow. You have an ability to go to the level of an eagle and that is where Vedantic knowledge comes in. Otherwise, to achieve success in the wheel, 10 points, what must be given and what you need to follow, you will find it in any book also. That is not the point about success. So Swami Chinmayananda says, you keep your goal so high that you must not be able to achieve it means you have to keep the highest goal and always you must be on the strive and struggle. 
So when success comes along in the way when you achieve um, intermediary things in life, relish it, enjoy it, but never get complacent at that level. You have a long way to go. You have greater things to achieve in life. Therefore, your success is actually not to be focused upon. You need to keep something here and forget it. Here is another point for you to think about. We said two things here for success. One is that Siddhir Bhavati Karmaja. Success is born of action. Right? Success is born of action. So we say action is the cause, success is the effect. The second also we said is, whatever you visualize yourself to be, whatever you think yourself to be, suppose I want to become a great businessman, I want to become a prime minister, I have to visualize that, I keep a goal or whatever it is, and that is what is going to lead me to that. If I consider myself to be a mayor or something, it will lead me to that. So here are two factors that we are talking about with reference to cause of success. One is your deep thought, One is, which is your visualization. One is what uh, uh, you want to you know, get, that thought. Another is action. We said action. So the question is, what is the real cause? Is action the real cause? Is the thought the real cause? Is both uh, necessary? If both are necessary, is something more important than the other? That has to be clearly understood. Nothing in the world can be achieved without a thought. Let it be very clear. Only when you visualize something, only when you are able to view something, which we say goal or whatever it is, you want aim or ambition, which you want to achieve, that must be there. A strong sankalpa has to be there. When you keep that sankalpa, how do you achieve it? That sankalpa or the thought itself has the power to transform itself into success. Be clear about it. Upanishad says that. Yam yam lokam manasa samvibhati vishuddha sattva kamayate yamscha kama. Tam tam lokam Jayate Kamscha Kama and Tasmat Atmanyam Ki Ache Bhuti Kamaha. Very interesting. Bhuti Kamaha. One who wishes, uh, one who desires success or pleasures in the world also must uh, worship one who is uh, one who is a Vishuddha Sattva. That, okay, we will not get into that mantra because we get involved in that mantra. What, what is interesting is Yam yam lokam manasasam vibhati. Whatever, whatever thought is there, that it will get achieved. Thought has the power of achievement in itself. This is what, if those of you who have seen this documentary or movie called Secret, they, they try, try to show it in various worldly achievements by certain graphics and certain incidents and episodes there. Uh, it's not wrong. What does Swami Ramadhinta Pictorically given us uh, 120 years back, that is what has come out as that uh, documentary also. Uh, way to fulfillment of desires, in that he says. So, the moment you think with that intense desire, it must come to you. Be it anything, be it anything in this world, that is the power of your thought. But it is all very nice to talk about even as a theory in this class, but practically it doesn't happen, isn't it? I require a mango. Where is the mango now? We say it doesn't come. All right. Everybody wants to be a millionaire. Where does the million come from? Uh, so, what is the, the, why is it not uh, happening? Is the law wrong? No, law is not wrong. The law is correct. The moment if you are able to have that sankalpa in its, uh, in its intense form, that thought has the power to pull the result towards you. That is how the universe is designed. This is based on the law of attraction, right? Law of attraction is not something very, uh, what to say, different from what we already know. We already know the law of desire, the law of love. That is what it is. Okay, what we understand as law of gravity at the physical level, right? Law of gravity says, 
every object in this world attracts every other object in this universe in a force which is proportional to its mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them. I repeat, every object attracts every other object in this universe in a force which is directly proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them. So Earth's gravity is that gravitational force, but the point is each and every object also has this force. But why are we not experiencing is that, that the Earth's gravitational pull is very, very powerful. Uh, it's very huge. We don't notice any other uh, force in compared to that. So each and every other object based on their density is able to pull each other. So exactly like that, if you are able to translate that this law of love or intensity or attraction at the mental level, your thought has that force. So more mass it gains by intensity, it is going to attract whatever object of desire or the object of love is. Be it a person, be it an object, be it an intangible thing, whatever it is, you are attracting it by the very thought itself. The question is, how intense is your desire? How intense is your thought? That is why we say, before wanting to achieve anything, you have a strong sankalpa. What does Bhagavad Gita say? We said, it says, Kankshanta karmanam siddhim yajanta iha devataha. So he is talking about yajanta. Yajanta means yajna. Perform yajna to God's man, you will achieve whatever you want to achieve. How? Chipra. Chipram means just like this, just like this. Chipram hi manushe loke siddhir bhavati karmacha. Manushe loke, in this world, in this world of mortal men. Chipram, just like that, quickly, quickly indeed. Siddhir bhavati karmacha. Success comes to you very easily, very quickly. As though for a person who is struggling for success, the statement is very mocking, but this is the truth. What? Kankshanta karmanam siddhim. What should you do? Yajanta yadeva. Do yajna man. Perform the right sacrifice, perform the right yajna and it will come easily. Who will give? Devatas will give. Don't worry. This is what he says. This is the literal translation. So come back to the yajna here. We talked about yajna a few weeks back. In yajna, what is important? Before you do every yajna, yajna is for a purpose. Yajna may be for begetting rain or begetting a sun. Uh, or uh, Bhumi Puja you do for a factory, uh, whatever. Or you do Yajna for even destruction of others. Some people do that. All these are said even in the Puranic stories also. You see that some person does a lot of uh, effort he puts in for destruction of others. Before every Yajna, when you start it, after the initial Ganesh Puja or something, the priest asks you to keep what is known as a Sankalpa. Sankalpa is what is this Yajna meant for? So then he says, this and this and this and this. This is what this is meant for. That is a strong thought that you must keep. After keeping that thought, what you do is that you forget it and perform actions. Perform this. Uh, Homa, Rar, Abhuti and all those things you do. This is exactly what needs to be translated in our day-to-day -day life. If you want to achieve something, I said the thought is important. If your thought is very powerful, that is why that mantra said in Upanishad, Vishuddha Sattva, a person who is in an extremely high state of renunciation or a high state of Sattva, one thought is enough and immediately what he thinks will materialize immediately. Swami Ramadirtha was in the height of Himalaya somewhere, above Uttarkarchi somewhere. A thought came to him that, how about reading Yoga Vashishta now? Next day somewhere somebody had uh, couriered or um, sent it by post and it was there on his lap. Imagine in those days, 100 years back, what would be the postal system and when this would have been uh, posted to him, we do not know. But he thought and the next day it came to him as the episode. For him, one thought or one sankalpa is enough and it will come. Why doesn't it come for us? Because our thoughts or our sankalpa is not as powerful or as intense. So at our level, what we should do to keep the thought focused, why it is not getting that powerful or intense? Because our mind plays tricks. Our mind plays tricks because 
it immediately goes into the future and starts partaking in the pleasure of the enjoyment of the food affection. The moment I say, I want a job, the mind, it is a, it is a thought. It is something that I want, let us say. It's a proper desire. But my mind immediately, what it does is, craves for it, yearns for it, uh, longs for it. All that time it is thinking of, I want a job, I want a job, or what are the things that will come along with the job, and various things are of worries and anxieties that are associated with the job. In this process, what is the thought flow that is there within you is what you must examine. Sir, uh, time is up. We, I leave you a uh, couple of thoughts for you to think about. When I say I want money, I want money, I am craving for money, actually who am I at this point of time? Irrespective of my bank balance, irrespective of my status and position in the society, when I crave for money, at this point of time, I am considering myself to be a beggar. Because I am yearning. Who, who will ask for money? Who will yearn for money? It's a beggar who will ask for money. When you consider yourself to be the beggar, you will be treated like a beggar. Remember this. As I said, what you value yourself, we do not know. We may not consider ourselves to be like that consciously. But this is what is happening at the subconscious level. At the unconscious level or subconscious level, you can say this. When I consider I put my position, put myself in a position that I am longing, craving, wanting, desperate about it. I am really putting myself in a beggar position, irrespective of whatever I am begging for. I am begging for knowledge or I am begging for. And think about it how each one of you or each one of us, how we will treat beggar. I am not talking about how you must have a love or affection for him. Imagine you are going to eat something in the train and you have taken up something. Somebody comes and says, give me something, you will give him, but it is not a very happy thing. Okay, take it and go, like that. A beggar will not be treated with a royal uh, feeling or a royal this thing. Because he has put himself in that position. I am talking about a natural instinct that comes for everybody. So when you consider yourself to be the beggar, why do you want universe to be, universe to treat you in any other way? It will not. So when you are craving for success, you consider yourself to be a loser now. This is the point that you must remember. When you think yourself to be a loser, your thoughts, desire and action will follow the line of a loser. And for that person, success will not come. So what will keep that thought intense in that same pristine form? That is where action comes so, Siddhir Bhavati Karmaja is a perfect statement. Action brings success. Action follows this thought. And what is the role of action mainly here? The role of action is to keep the mind aloft in the ideal and not go into that craving or begging position. So, therefore, it is the thought plus follow up with action that is going to yield success. So these two statements you think about, we will continue with this topic in the next class because uh, it has various other facets to cover. One is your motto in life should be to strive, to struggle, not to succeed. Second one is this. A fabulous statement again by Swami Ramatheta. The way to gain anything is to lose it. We all want success. Therefore, you have to take away the thought of success from your mind. This is the formula. This is the way. There is no other way, in fact. Every other person who has achieved success also has applied this formula consciously or unconsciously. That is a statement that we can make. If we have the data enough to analyze, this can be proved also. The way to gain anything is to lose it. One statement. Another is that the motto in life is should be to strive, to struggle, not to succeed. We will continue in the next class. Oh. Oh.
Shanti, 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 Shanti. 